Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Patty Smith and Laura Kovacs to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Hello, everybody. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> seriously, I don't feel so good, but don't worry, I, I'm beyond catch your, it being catching, and, uh, and, but I really didn't want to cancel, so um, I thought that the best... So I came a little early with my sister, Linda, and uh, we signed all the book, or I signed them, but she... <laughs> <laughs> Now we're busted. <laughs> no, I, I signed them, but she, she helped slide them over. And uh, so all the books are signed, and, and uh, I'm really sorry. But it was the only, it was the, the best way that I could be able to be with you this evening. So Thank you. anyway, thanks. Thank you for not canceling. Uh, welcome back. This is your fifth visit to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Well, I'll be back for the next five books. Please. <laughs> I want to say at the outset, we'll just give the plan for the night, but I do want to tell you how, I hope you know how beloved you are here in this city. Oh, um, <laughs> Well, I, you know, I've always loved Philadelphia. Uh, since I was a child, I, of course, I went to school in Germantown as a small girl, and then we moved to South Jersey, but Philadelphia was our city, and uh, um, my uh, dad was, uh, he loved the Philadelphia Phillies and the Eagles, and, um, but I have to say, my sister and I um, met together at uh, our hotel, which is at, right across the street from the from Independence Hall, and I was so thrilled to be there and walk around. It's just it's so moving. It's so moving and beautiful to be to be there. And it was such a great day. There were a million little squirrels out and birds, <laughs> and the ginkgo trees, the gold leaves were falling. It was beautiful. So no matter how long you stay in New York, we know it sustains you there. You speak beautifully of New York, but you are always a daughter of this city, and we are so proud of you. Oh, thank you. So we're going to talk for a little bit, and then we are going to hand the mics over to the audience. They are anxious to talk to you, too. Um, I, of course, live in a world of books, and so I'm going to start there. This is another gorgeous book. Um, when you won the National Book Award for your last book, when you were last here, you said this. I dreamed of having a book of my own, a writing one that I could put on a shelf. Please, no matter how far we advance techno technologically, please don't abandon the book. And what beautiful words. That meant a lot to the people um, at the library here, for sure. Um, as you go through your books, it's clear that you find a certain companionship in these authors that you admire, Rambeau, Baudelaire, Genet, uh, and certainly there are readers out there who feel the exact same way when they're reading your books. They find inspiration more than anything. They find companionship. I want to know what you'd like to say to them. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, it's I've never, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but I love my book so much and the fact, since I was a child and uh, uh, used to get all my books um, for my birthday at Leary's. I don't know if anyone remembers Leary's bookstore. But when I was a little girl, uh, for a dollar, and every year on my birthday, my mother uh, would bring me to Leary's and we'd give a, um, there was a, I don't know if it was old Mr. Leary, but uh, an old fella, at, and he, he got such a kick out of me. He'd give me a shopping bag, and then I was allowed to go to the children's department and fill it for a dollar and my birthday. And uh, I got so many beautiful books, whether, you know, Uncle Wiggly or, or um, you know, uh, the Wizard of Oz books and all the wonderful books. And uh, they've been my friends my whole life. And to imagine writing a book that might be someone else's friend is just wonderful. Thanks. Um, 
when you're when you're writing a book or when you're writing a poem or even when you're writing lyrics, you have such tight control over the words you're using it's, and such precision in trying to communicate whatever it is this the creative impulse that you're trying to share. Um, what's the difference with that and with performing live? It's a totally different experience, I would think. Well, well, thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, I mean, I. I uh, I do labor somewhat to um, to get such an easy feeling flow, but uh, um, I think that the biggest difference is when you're writing a poem or writing a book, your first essential duty is to the work itself. And so uh, it's a luxury to think of the reader. First you have to like commit to the work and the world of the work and, and uh, you know, make it as as perfect as you can. Um, but when you're writing songs or performing, um, your your the responsibility shifts. Uh, you're you're first of all, one doesn't write. You're writing songs for people to hear. Uh, you're writing lyrics to to communicate uh, quickly. Um, and so you have a responsibility to the listener. You also, for me, I, I only write about maybe a quarter of my own music. So I have a responsibility to the musicians. So it's a whole different experience. It's a more collaborative energy. And um, uh, because when I'm writing lyrics, I'm thinking about it's not just the world of the lyric, I'm thinking about the people and how will they experience it and how can I perform it in a way that is meaningful to them. And uh, so it's not as, it's, 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 not a, uh, it's not as insular as writing a poem or uh, writing a book. I mean, in the end, it's, it's all for the reader or the listener, but the process is different. I, I hope that makes yeah. sense. And the responsibility you feel yes, to the art. The, to the, the other responsibility artists. is different. And, um, and performing, it's even another, uh, it, it go goes even rawer because when I'm performing, I'll often sacrifice uh, clarity or, you know, beauty for the, uh, direct communication, sometimes for humor sometimes for a more visceral experience um, because the most important thing when you're performing is to stay in contact with the people. And uh, so, it, and that's a huge responsibility. You can't go off into your own world any more than like a minute or two if you're improvising. Even Coltrane or somebody, you know, uh, j jazz musicians, they will go off for a little while but then they have to return and reconnect with the people. And when you're writing, especially poetry, it, you, 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 there's, there's no, it's like there's no other world, just, just the world of the work. Um, and how much of your performance is improvisational? And, and I guess to that end, what I'm really wondering is, what does it feel like when you look out and you see now somebody is recording something live when you have this raw, creative energy that you're trying to communicate something immediately and you look out and you're thinking, this is gonna be online before I leave the stage. Well, <laughs> I, I found it really disturbing for a while. So much so disturbing I wanted to quit because for two reasons. Um, I like communicating directly with people. I like us all to become within the uh, uh, experience of performing one mind and becoming one organi organism. And you know, it's sort of a, almost a, not being mystical or anything, just an energy, a telepathic energy. And it's very hard to do that when the, those waves are broken by people on the phone or people texting or people taking pictures or looking at the film they just shot. Uh, and it's, uh, and, and I, so that you have to wrestle with that, you know, and, uh, I found it really repellent and, um, and I still find it extremely distracting and sometimes I just tell people to 
to stop or I'll even yell at them or I'll, I'll stop a concert <laughs> because I, I just need for them to cool out, you know, and just yeah. be present for me. But because I'm, you know, learning, we're in the 21st century, young people, this is their world, this is the world they're brought up in, uh, this is what, this is part of their everyday experience and natural for them. I've, I've tried to find a, a compromise where I let them do their thing, I'm doing my thing, but at a certain point, they gotta like, they gotta like get in the flow or because I'm meaner than they are. <laughs> <laughs> As far as uh, technology, I guess this is another question for you. Um, art has become more democratic in a way, in that you know you had to save up all your money and record every song that you could basically afford to record at that time. And now, you can record a song and publish it. You can publish a book. You can publish a poem. You can do all of these things here at your local library. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well. I think, um, I look at it, I don't think of it as art. I think, because I think that I still have an old fashioned view of art as a real calling. And um, I think of it as really the creative process and expressing oneself is open to everyone. Uh, just because you make a record or, or, or take a photograph or, or, or paint a picture doesn't necessarily make you an artist any more than baking one cookie, you know, or like making some Toll House cookies makes you a baker, you know. Um, I like Toll House cookies, nothing, nothing, uh, I'm just, I'm simply saying that it's a, it's a vocation, you know, that you have to, um, that requires a lifetime of devotion, sacrifice, and so in talking about art, that's a whole different subject. In talking about people being able to express themselves in a democratic way, I think that's fantastic. I mean, when I was young, you had to be a photographer and be able to, uh, um, to take a picture. You had to be able to afford a camera. You know, you didn't see, you know, everybody running around taking pictures of everything. You only saw photographers do that. And also it was a financial thing. Uh, certainly, most of us couldn't afford to make our own little records. And um, I think it's great that people can express themselves, you know, to be able to, they want to make a record, especially in, in the world of rock and roll. Rock and roll is really a grassroots art. It was really made by the people, you know, embraced by the people. It's, it belongs to the people. I love to see uh, people, you know, go in their garage or in their basement or in their bedroom, you know, or in their local library and- uh, Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Make a record, you know, post a poem. But that is an act of creative expression. Creative expression, I think, is, um, belongs to everybody. You know, to be an artist, though, is, is, an, is a deeper, deeper commitment and much more complicated. But I think that, I, not to be redundant, but I, like you said, this process, the process of being able to express yourself and even express yourself publicly because of the internet has been democratized. And I, I think it's good. I think everyone has the right or should taste what it feels like to, to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, back to the book or starting with the book. Uh, there's a number of, of your Polaroids in this book, and you tend to, or you seem to take pictures of objects that, to me, it's like this talismanic feeling that you get. Like, you, I wonder if you're taking a picture of Virginia Woolf's walking stick. Are you, first, are you feel like transported to her atmosphere? And the other thing is, you're taking a picture of an object that belonged to an artist, and it just seems like you are elevating that object almost to the realm of art. Well, 
thank you. <laughs> I'll spend the whole night saying thank you. I'm out of here. But, uh, well, uh, there's a few different reasons. Um, one is uh, a, a very simple reason. Because of uh, being a singer, um, when, when I tour, like this summer, uh, we did 51 concerts, and uh, so I and I was in 40, 49 cities. So I get to travel quite a bit and see places and see things that even a person who likes to travel doesn't get to be in those many cities and uh, sometimes very uh, obscure cities. And so when I see things that I know that the average person isn't going to see, I like to take a picture of it to share it, sort of a, like a sort of like a second or third class relic. You know, it gives people uh, the opportunity to experience. Not many people get to see Herman Hesse's typewriter. You have to pretty, you know, it's a pretty uh, a complex journey to go see that typewriter. <laughs> and, um, but I saw it and I photographed it and in that way I can share it. Um, also, uh, objects, I've always since I was a kid uh, felt uh, a very strong uh, attachment to objects. I think it came, if I analyzed it, I would think it came from reading like Hans Christian Andersen's stories and uh, Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Ann and Andy to my, uh, to my sister, my sister, my, my siblings and I read all of these books and all, and the idea of our toys coming alive at night, like in these stories, seemed completely possible to me. You know, I, 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 I felt, you know, something for these toys that I imagined, you know, had a life of their own. You know, and you, you know, there's something of that feeling when I look at these things. Virginia Woolf's cane, she took many walks in the, you know, the moors and, you know, uh, across the marshes and, and with that cane. You know, that cane was her companion when she was thinking and walking. And so it has within it her energy, her, you know, her handprint almost. And, uh, you know, Herman Hesse typed the glass bead game on that typewriter. You know, and I look at the spectacles of James Joyce. He saw the world through those spectacles. So they have a very, you know, special, they have something special. But the same as, you know, I have my father's coffee cup as sacred as any of those objects, you know. And uh, uh, so I, I think we all have that. Um, and I, I, taking these pictures uh, and taking them in a way, hopefully, that is aesthetically pleasurable gives it that double thing, hopefully to lift them in the realm of art, but also to share them with the viewer. I wonder if you would read a brief section here. Well, I just happened to have my glasses. <laughs> we did not rehearse. <laughs> I hope to set aside my impatient woes, be of service, and possibly add a few images to adorn my Polaroid rosary. I was glad to be going somewhere else. All I needed for the mind was to be led to new stations. All I needed for the heart was to visit a place of greater storms. I overturned a card from my tarot deck and then another as casually as turning over a leaf. Find the truth of your situation, set out boldly. I covered all three envelopes with leftover Christmas stamps and slipped them in the leather box on the way to the deli. Then I bought a box of spaghetti, green onions, garlic, and a tin of anchovies and made myself a meal. It was all for the recipe, right? It was. <laughs> <laughs> it was that image, the, the Polaroid rosary. It's just so striking. 
and especially with what you're saying. I just wanted to share that with the audience. Well, I can tell you where that came from. I mean, how I, uh, it came from um, when travelers, I, 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 I don't know if they still do this, but perhaps they do. Pilgrims um, used to uh, go, um, go on this pilgrimage called the St. James Way in Spain where they had to go to, I think, like 16 different uh, churches and, uh, in Spain. And when they would go, it would be an arduous uh, journey by foot and they would go and pray at each, at each church. And each time they would um, get a little medal, um, you know, a, a, some type of little medal, maybe the Sacred Heart or Mary or Jesus, and they would put it, you know, on their rosary. And uh, I always sometimes I think of these pictures that I take on my way, on my pilgrimages. They're my little talisman or my little uh, um, souvenir of my journeys. So I get that's where that came from. It's what it seems like. The pil pilgrimage is the exact word that it, that comes to mind because you're you're paying homage, homage to all these artists that you're on your travels. Um, I I'd like to talk to you about your thoughts on the nature of fame and the nature of fandom, uh, especially here and <coughs> working in the office that I do, and you know people calling. People feel really connected with you in a really profound, sincere way that's real. What is that like from your side? Uh, well, I is mean, it weird? <laughs> I mean, I I'm not that analytical, and I wouldn't want to presume what people think. But it might just be because, well, I've been around for a long time. I do. I I'm not giant famous like like a movie star, but I I do have a certain amount of fame. But I'm also sort of well, I'll never be a regular person because I've always been a little weird, but I'm just, <laughs> but I'm uh, more accessible, I think, than, uh, you know, I'm just sort of normal, you know, I'm just a person. And maybe people feel that, uh, that, make, that's, that, that makes it easier to connect, you know, I'm not the, you know, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> it's embarrassing, I don't know. I'm just it's nice if people you like also, me. You also, um, over the years, have kept your ticket prices really low. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, it's so uncommon now. Did, did promoters just not dare talk to Patty well, Smith no, like no, that? Or no, does I, nobody tell I you just, what to do? I just fight with them. Yeah. They don't like it. I mean, nobody likes it because the promoters make less money. The agent makes less money. Um, but... I just find it repellent that people want so much money to see rock and roll concert. It's just the same with baseball. I find it repellent that, that you know, it's a common man's, uh, and when I say common man, I say it with love. It's, it's the common man's sport. People should be able to go and watch a baseball game and take their kids and not have to use a week's pay. And, uh, and I feel the same way with rock and roll. I, my ticket prices are as low as I can make them and break even and, uh, and also because, you know, it costs a certain amount of money to play at a venue. I mean, you can't just, you know, be, uh, the money that you make in a concert, this much money might be made, but the venue costs, you know, the, the security and all that stuff that I have no control over. But I do have a control over of how much money that we'll make. And if I would rather make this much rather than that much and have people pay a huge amount of money. Now, I can't do anything about people that scalp or anything like that. I can't control that stuff. But I can control my ticket prices. And so can every single person that plays rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> When they say they can't control it, they're full of shit, you know? 
I mean, sometimes people do sell themselves to Live Nation, but then they've done that, you know? So, I mean, I, I wouldn't pay $1,000 or $250 to see, to see anybody, except opera, but, <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other thing, but. Uh, <laughs> A lot of anyway, it's just my opinion. I'm just <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> a lot of just kids, and even in this book too, there's so much talk about work. Um, one of the things that always struck me is like, you just kids, you're working in a factory, you're in a bookstore. There's that quote from the prophet, work is love made visible. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the value of work in your life. Well, my family had a, my, both my father and mother had a strong work ethic. You know, we were taught, you know, I mean, by example, just by example, my mom and dad worked really hard. They both had jobs um, and they had four kids to raise. You know, the, the times were, uh, were, were difficult. And, uh, you know, we learned that if you, and also we were brought up at the time where there were no credit cards and things like that. So if you wanted something, you had to have the money. You had to earn the money and be able to pay directly for it. And, uh, you know, I've just, just still maintained that, that, that way of operating. And in terms of, uh, you know, working, you know, doing my work, whether it's, you know, with my band or working on my book or my books or whatever. I mean, I work every day. You know, if I, I write every single day of my life, you know, even if it's just a sentence or even to record a dream or a conversation, I, it's like, you know, I, it's, it's part of what I do. I think that discipline and having some kind of work ethic and some kind of discipline is really healthy. And uh, you know, just be one one being an artist doesn't mean that you have like no, you're just flotsam and jetsam. It takes uh, huge amounts of uh, study and practice, and uh, you know, failure, you know, and and, and sacrifice, and uh, the, all of that's healthy. It's it's it's. Uh, I think that we're. We're in danger right now because in our present culture, first of all, because of credit cards and because we're in a, a techni te technology and credit cards and social media, uh, values have shifted. And um, so it's important to really uh, think about these things in the simplest of terms. And uh, anyway, uh, I guess I... I'm just rambling at this point. It's my illness. I'm just <laughs> rambling. I could feel it. I'm sorry. <laughs> the point is you work hard. I don't know that the audience is aware you're on a double tour right now. Yeah, I mean, I do work hard, I, I, but I like to work. You know, I like, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't imagine not working, you know. I mean, my idea of retiring is not having to travel so much so I can work at, at home, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I like to, I, I, I like working. I mean, I, I you know, I, I think um, my husband's grandparents um, lived till they were in their mid 90s and they lived in West, they were farmers in West Virginia and I remember his grandmother at 92, you know, going out in the field with her and she, she would look around and she'd go, dig over there. <laughs> and I'd just dig over there and out would, I'd find a potato. She'd go, all right, dig over there. <laughs> and and they, they, they did, they worked in the fields and, and uh, you know, she was still baking her own bread and, and digging up her own potatoes except when I was there. And, uh, <laughs> and it was healthy, working every day. Work is good. Work is good for you. Um, when the audience walked in tonight, Horses is playing, and it's 40 years old. I'm wondering if you still feel close to it, and the, and the people and the, the feelings that compelled you to write it. Well, I mean, I, I have evolved 
quite a bit since since uh, since we recorded horses. I mean, some of the lyrics on horses I wrote when I was 20. I'm 68 years old, so I would hope that I would evolve since horses. <laughs> but um, but as you know, in performing it, we have been performing it as an album, and uh, you know, I feel. I, I, it's easy for me to reconnect with that person and bring it into present tense. And, uh, you know, I'm just, again, you know, grateful that 40 years later, people are still interested, you know, in the work, you know, people that it still has a life. And, uh, but I, I also, also, I'm always excited about the next thing, the future thing. I mean, I'm, I, I write about the past, but I'm very happy to be in the present. You know, I'll, I'll do songs from the past, but I, the, I try to bring them all into the present. And how I do that is to stay in contact with the people that are, you know, at, with the people because even like right now, I mean, if I just was talking in my own world and ignoring everybody here, what would be the point of us all being together? You know, so, you know, it's, there's a lot of, at our concerts for horses, there's been a lot of young people. I would say we're really lucky as a band, 60% of our audience is under 25. And uh, that's, that's awesome to have a younger generations so interested in what you do. And also their energy and their hunger for knowledge or answers or communication, you can, it's, it's palatable and uh, you can feel it and it's joyful. Is that, is that your take too? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of loss in M train mind train, I think of it. Uh, there's a lot of loss. There's a lot of tremendous loss that you experience pretty young in life and people extremely close to you leaving your life. Is it, but yet they, they pop up in this book like they're keeping you company. Um, is, it, <laughs> is it sad or are they, are they with you? Are you sharing them with us or are you bringing them back? Well, I mean, I do walk with the people that I've lost. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I access my mother all the time. Sometimes, uh, you know, when I, it could be a simple thing like uh, my daughter has a sore throat and I'm, you know, my mother had to tend to me a lot because I was a, sort of a sickly kid. And I, I access what my mother did for me, you know, or I, you know, sometimes if, well, I mean, it's just, sorry, I'm just trying to answer your question better because something you said, uh, um, you said, do they pop up or do I conjure them or, yeah, they do pop up and it is sad sometimes, but to not have them would be so much sadder. I mean, when you lose people, that they, they have that phrase, time heals all wounds. It, that's not true at all. <laughs> nothing, nothing really heals wounds. It's just that in time you learn how to ride it out. It's like a roller coaster, you know, and, and, or, or sometimes it's, you know, so physical and so present, it, it's almost unbearable. And then there's, you know, it's just smooth sailing. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say sometimes I, I'm just minding my own business and all of a sudden my brother or my husband or my parents or m our cat, you know, comes right, almost right in my face and I, uh, it's, it's, it takes your breath away. But, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have known these people and wonderful to revisit them or them coming into your consciousness when you're just daydreaming or, you know, coming into your dreams. And we should never shut, shut the dead out. You know, they're dead, but they're, you know, 
what does that mean? They're, they're, oh, they're within us. They're in our consciousness, so we should enjoy them. There's you know? a line in your book, oh, to be reborn within the pages of a book. And I thought, here, you're bringing back these people. Well, I mean, it, it's, I'd never, when I wrote the, this, this, this book was, you know, M is sort of for a mind, it is sort of a mind train. I mean, that was the idea. But it's also, it was a mystery because I had no plot. I had no, I didn't want one. My last book was so structured, took me so long to write, and I had so much responsibility to Robert, to New York City, to all the people in the book, to the, the chronology of the book. And I just wanted to write a book that I had no responsibility. I didn't know where I was going, how I was going to end. I didn't know what I was going to write about. One day, I just started writing, and I wrote till I was done. And uh, that was, it was liberating. And um, I, uh, I forget what the question was. <laughs> Let's sorry, I totally forgot what we were talking about. I'm sorry. That makes two of us. Let's move on. I have I've been flagged. I have one more question for you, and then I'm going to turn, turn the audience on I'm you. sorry. Don't be it's sorry. It's not that I wasn't paying attention. I just, like... <laughs> uh, in so many ways, Horses was a mirror of the culture at that time. If you were gonna write that album for 2015, what would it sound like? What would your anthem be, your you love song? For now? Yeah. Would it be angry or hopeful? I have, I actually, I have no idea. I mean, well, I mean, I, th I think that it, knowing myself, it would be very similar, only different subjects. I would probably, uh, Well, I, 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 because I think that I would be, it would be definitely anti, anti-war, anti-government, <laughs> anti-corporation. It would be a lot of antis. <laughs> it would be, you know, concerned with our environment, for our earth. Maybe it would just simply be a hymn to Mother Nature, and uh, ask others to. Um, um, uh, spend more time, um, you know, uh, embracing nature instead of destroying it. Uh, I don't know what she'd do. I'm sure besides all that, it would be somewhat troublesome, you know, <laughs> somewhat irreverent, but, uh, you know. <laughs> I, um, I'm like really starstruck. This is my first time like ever meeting like a accomplished author. What's what's some stories you've had of like meeting like authors that you've looked up to so much? Um, what, what? Well, uh, oh, actually, I in the book I talk about um, the writer Murakami, and uh, I talk about a question that I really want to ask Murakami. And uh, when I wrote the book, I never thought I'd ever get to meet Murakami. And I was obsessed about this question. So then I was called by a, um, a very big German newspaper who asked me to come to Berlin to present Murakami with a medal or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, OK, I thought this is. So I went to Berlin, sang a little song for Murakami, and uh, you know gave him his prize, and uh, and then we had a little dinner after, and I had a moment, little time to spend with Murakami, and so I asked him the question, and he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> It was about his book, too. <laughs> he didn't remember writing it. He didn't remember what it... <laughs> now, Murakami is very playful, so when I thought about it later, I thought maybe he was, you know, um, 
Well, I don't know. All I know is I didn't get anywhere. <laughs> but it was worth it anyway, because he is one of our great writers, and I was very happy to meet him and, and uh, sing a little song for him and his wife. But uh, I didn't get any answers. So, Hello, Patty. Thanks for coming to Philadelphia. It's really Thanks. great to spend some time with you. But my question is, I know in your book you talked a lot about TV detectives, and I'd once heard that you, you were writing a detective novel. Is that true, and is that something maybe you would want to do? Yes, I am working on a detective novel. I've been working on it off and on for a few years, and, uh, but that's, I, need, uh, I need a lot of time to finish that. But yes, and I promise uh, in the next couple of years I'll finish it. And it's really one of my uh, pet sort of secret projects. Is it? It's semi-secret, <laughs> but, it, but it's true. I, I can only tell you that in my detective novel, uh, you know, crime is not important. mind of the detective we're concerned with here. I just, I just lost about several hundred prospective buyers. Hello. Hi. Um, so earlier you mentioned uh, a little bit about what, what it is to be an artist and having the artist calling. Um, I thought if you could remember the first time you felt the artist calling. Um, well, I can tell you two times. The first four, the first was when I read Little Women, and I was very young. Um, I love books so much. I mean, I just cherish books. And in Little Women, I read uh, that a girl, not unlike myself, sort of a tomboy, sort of, uh, you know, antisocial, not wearing the right dresses, um, wrote stories and eventually books and jo her name was Jo March and so I learned in that book that a girl could write a book and uh, that's when I decided I wanted to write that I was going to write I thought if Jo can write I can write and the first time I had a physical visceral feeling of wanting to be an artist was in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I was about 12. And my father and mother took um, me and my siblings uh, to the museum. I don't know why, we never went again. We only went that one time. <laughs> <laughs> and we had never been in an art museum. And of course, the Philadelphia Museum of Art is one of the most beautiful uh, museums in the world, and uh, we went, and I think there was a John Singer Sargent show. It was maybe Sargent and Aikens, or, you know, I, it was so long ago, you know, I, I was 12. Um, but I saw the painting of the girl in the white dress, and, uh, you know, and she looked so beautiful, and, and I just loved these paintings so much. And to see real paintings in person was so exciting. But then I went down a hallway, and it was like the hallway of Picassos. There was one Picasso after another, different periods. You know, maybe there was a blue period drawing and, and some Cubist drawings. And, and I don't know what happened, but I, I was completely spellbound. I, I saw those Picassos and I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be an artist. And it just completely took me over. And, um, and all of them, not just representational. I mean, the, the Cubist drawings or um, things that were uh, more abstract. I just, uh, I didn't know anything about Picasso and I didn't really know anything about the mechanics of art, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do in my life. And, uh, and that was here in Philadelphia.
Hi, I'm um, sorry. Um, as an artist, how do you personally view your own work? Are you critical? Are you a perfectionist? Or do you just let it like flow freely? And also, like I'm a singer, and I'm wondering how you feel about your own voice when you sing, because I'm so critical of my own personally. <laughs> well, um, when I'm writing, uh, yeah, I'm I'm hyper. Well, one. When you're just inspired and you're sitting writing in your notebooks, you're not really criticizing, you're just letting yourself, you know, you're just expressing yourself. But when I'm putting together a book, um, finishing something, I am hi hi hypercritical. I go through every single line. And a lot of it is because, because I began writing poetry before prose, I have a tendency to want to hear a certain, even if it's only in my head, a certain way, musical way that each sentence falls into the next sentence. And uh, uh, so I, I would say that I'm fairly self-critical. As In terms of singing, I've never really considered myself a singer. I mean, I consider myself a performer and uh, I never really liked my singing voice, especially when I was younger. I don't really understand my voice. Um, it's the one that I have. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, um, you know, I would rather listen to other singers. But, um, but I, when I'm singing, um, it's such a strange thing because I just love uh, natural singers you know, somebody like, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Joan Baez or Darlene Love or Maria Callas or whoever I'm listening to, the, the female voice. I could be listening to Rihanna or Adele or any of them. Um, uh, Bonnie Raitt, beautiful, clear, perfect voice. Um, I, I just, I don't have that, but... Um, but what I do have is a desire to communicate to the people I'm singing to. And I guess what I've learned about how to express myself through singing, a lot I've learned through opera. Because in opera, you know, the, you can really feel the inner narrative in an aria. You know, I've listened to hundreds of arias, and I don't speak Italian. I, I listen to operas over and over and don't even know what they're about, but I don't really care. I'm just listening to how, you know, the emotion is drawn from people through the arc of their performance. So I don't know if I've really answered your question, but uh, in the end, I'd rather listen to other singers. <laughs> How are you? I can hear your Philadelphia accent. I read your book, and I want to know, because I know you were number 23, CDC, why did it break up? I don't know. No, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it was dissipating anyway. I mean, it was just ran its course, and they'll do something else, you know. But, uh, you know, it's just like why Eno Cafe, you know, why, why, why places close, why things end. They end. But I probably wouldn't have written about it so much. If they hadn't, well, it's, it's a long, it's an abstract conversation since if many people didn't read the book. But I, I'm not, I'm not uh, being um, coy with you. I just really don't know. I just wanted to ask, um, you've been a role model to me as a person, a woman, and most recently as a parent. And I really admire the way you've lived your life as an individual. And I have a nine-year-old daughter right now. And I wonder what advice you would give to a nine-year-old girl trying to grow up today. Well, I would just, you know, the, the, the simple advice I always gave my own children was just to do the best that you can and um, in whatever you do, you know, it's not, uh, you know, 
You don't, if, if you're in a sports team and you're not very good, you don't measure yourself by anyone else. You measure yourself by do it, by how, if you do the best you can. You know, if you get a C in science and you did your very best, then that's, that's okay. Just do the best you can. And also to think for yourself, you know, and to be, you know, to, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to, to judge yourself by not the things that you have, the material things that you have, but how you are inside, how you conduct yourself by your deeds, by your actions. You know, to just, uh, I think it's good for us to encourage young people to, um, uh, to assess themselves by their own merit stripped of all the all material things technology um, you know um, well material things and it's very hard right now because we live in a culture where people are judging themselves by how many friends they have on a Facebook or how many you know tweets or how many you know, whatever. I mean, I don't do any of that stuff, so I might not be saying it right, but still judging themselves by things like that, it's, it's really, it's, it's not really a um, lasting or really, in the end, meaningful judgment. They, the, I think it's important to encourage uh, our young people to feel themselves as an individual. And they have to connect with the world because it's the world we live in. And in the 21st century, it's a technological world. But to remember who they are as an individual, unconnected. And uh, anyway, that's my thought. Uh, hey, Patty. Um, I, I've seen you perform a uh, number of times. Um, in different different cities, you have a great band. Have you ever considered doing uh, an acoustic tour? Oh, uh, I do small acoustic tours, usually with my son and daughter. Um, you know, we get we get work here and there. <laughs> oh yeah, he opened with my daughter. Yeah. Well, my, Michael has, you know, you know, Michael is always, Michael could walk on my stage anytime, but uh, he actually likes to watch our shows, so, but he's always there. Um, I mean, uh, but um, we do, I do a lot of uh, acoustic shows, especially in Europe with my kids, sometimes like Jackson, my son Jackson is a guitarist, my daughter Jessie is a pianist. And, uh, well, we haven't, we have to be invited. I'm not as popular in Philadelphia as you think. Ouch. <laughs> you know, I would like to say that the library uh, did hire you and your daughter yes. a yeah. couple of years ago. Welcome home, Patty. Thank you. My question will be, what do they mean today? 50 years ago, this minute, I was out in West Philadelphia seeing the Rolling Stones. I know that you're a big fan of that band. In the context of what you were talking about earlier, of prices of tickets and rock and roll and corporate world taking it over. 50 years later, I'm here celebrating the Rolling Stones by seeing you. I couldn't think of a better way to do it. But what do the Rolling Stones mean to you now? Well, I mean, the Rolling Stones were um, such an important part of our culture. They have given us um, such a great body of work. Um, you know, they gave them, they've given, they've given their lives to rock and roll uh, at great cost to us, but um, sometimes, <laughs> but... <laughs> but it's that simple there, I mean, they're one of the greatest rock and roll bands in, in history. And, uh, 
you know, I, I don't, I haven't seen the, Ro the Rolling Stones in recent years, but, uh, you know, and I don't agree with their ticket prices, but uh, they were one of our great bands. They've written some of the greatest songs ever, the greatest dance songs ever. Um, they've made life so much more interesting when I was a teenager. So, uh, you know, I have just affection for them. But I'm not buying one of those tickets for them. Hi, I'm Shannon. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, I'm here for my friend Sarah. It's her birthday. Yeah. It's your birthday today? Yeah. So we came oh. here for you because you're one of her sheroes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sarah. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for spending your birthday in the library. Yeah. yeah. My question to you is, uh, she's a, a beautiful poet, and we're starting a band. And I wanted to know um, how you feel about how do you know when you're writing poems or when you're writing lyrics? And then what advice would you give to women that are starting bands that might not be that good at instruments? <laughs> sort of like myself, you know. Well, I mean, a poem and a lyric, to me, they're, it's what we were talking about before. It has to do with responsibility. A poem, I think writing poetry is probably the most complex, or the mo for me, the most difficult of all the arts. And when you're writing a poem, your absolute responsibility is to the poem, the world of the poem, you know, the, 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 the well, the poem. And when you're writing lyrics, your responsibility is to the listener, you're the person who, if you've written music, you're the, it's, it's the responsibility to the music, to the, how it can be performed. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a more collaborative uh, uh, way of communicating. And uh, um, in terms of advice, my first advice is don't think of yourself as a, 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 a woman rock band. Just think of yourself as a rock band. I think that in my way of thinking in the 70s, I canned all that, you know? I never thought of myself as a girl in rock and roll. I was a rock and roll singer. And uh, guys don't have to say, I'm a guy band, you know? <laughs> you know, why should girls have to be a girl band? You know, we're just like, we're workers, you know? And, you know, work hard, you know? I just... Uh, if you don't play that good, then just keep practicing. <laughs> Hi, Patty. Hi. Um, I had a question if you have any favorite pieces of three-dimensional art, and if any of that imagery has found its way into your work. Three-dimensional art, you mean sculpture? Yeah. <laughs> it's the 21st century. Yeah, we used to call that sculpture in my day. <laughs> well, I would say... <laughs> my... Brancusi is my favorite sculptor, and uh, um, I'm sure they have uh, some nice examples of Brancusi in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. In fact, they had an unbelievably great retrospective, um, beautiful Brancusi show in Philadelphia, I don't know, about 10 years ago or something, or 12. I got yelled at because I touched one of them. But, <laughs> um, and, uh, but I also really love Michelangelo. I love his, uh, I love his slaves, especially. Be uh, Michelangelo didn't finish a lot of his work, which it makes it even more compelling, because you can really feel the, the, the uh, subject trying to break free of the marble and uh but I, I i you know i love sculpture but what was it how does it come into my work well 
Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I've written a song or two with mentioning Brancusi, but I mean, when you asked me that, all of a sudden I thought of Spinal Tap. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> Remember in Spinal Tap how they wanted like Stonehenge to come down? I, remember, I saw the first time I saw Spinal Tap with, with my late husband, uh, I, when they did that, when they, they ordered the Stonehenge um, replicas to come down on the stage, and uh, if you had not seen Spinal Tap, uh, the idea was they were going to have these replicas and the, they were supposed to be seven, like say seven feet or, um, or 11 feet and instead the guy wrote 11 inches by mistake. <laughs> <coughs> so the big moment when they're singing Stonehenge, Stone, and they come down and they're like this big. <laughs> No, I haven't incorporated any three-dimensional uh, work into my... Hi. Hi. In Just Kids, your religious upbringing seemed a lot more apparent and seemed to inspire a lot of your work with a lot of Christian references and Catholic references, and I was wondering if you left that out of M. Train intention. Well, Robert was a Catholic. It was... The Catholic references were a lot to do with Robert's work. I mean, M Train is not just kids. If you read two books by Hemingway, you're not going to find bulls in, you know, uh, <laughs> Old Man in the Sea. <laughs> but actually, actually, you're wrong because the references that we were speaking of, the relic aspects of objects, um, which, which is referred to many times in M Train, is, uh, is, is, uh, is um, a classic Catholic reference. It doesn't mean that, the, that it's Catholic as a religion, I'm just saying that the, the reverence of relics um, is, and that's why we were talking about the Polaroid rosary as a metaphor. So it comes in in a different way. In Just Kids, obviously, Robert was Catholic. His work was infused with uh, Catholic, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, imagery, and thank you. And uh, <laughs> so, it would be, it would make sense that there was much more uh, um, uh, references. Um, yeah, uh, this person with a white blouse right there. <laughs> she reminded, you know, it's like being in school and you really want to. I want to know, I want to know about the bag of clothes that was brought to you um, at a reading in Illinois um, and some of the stories connected to the objects that were brought, the clothing or the t-shirt that you're wearing right now, and if there's a story connected to that. Well, you can only pick one. <laughs> What's, what is the best story? What? Which one has the best story? <laughs> okay, what about the t-shirt you're wearing right now? The t-shirt is from the Electric Lady Studios, which is Jimi Hendrix Studio which is where I recorded Horses. And uh, I've recorded several albums there, but where I recorded Horses. Jimi Hendrix opened the studio in uh, 1970, um, right before he died. And as a young girl, I was present at the opening and got to talk to him. And then he went to England and sadly died and never came back to use the studio. But I unbeknownst to me, who was just a girl who worked in a bookstore at the time, wound up using the studio about f mm, almost five years later to record horses. And um, this is their t-shirt, and it's my lucky shirt, and I love it so much that the head of Electric Lady gave me 40 of them. <laughs> And 
until next time, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Patty Smith. Thank you, everybody.